We have been looking for many years for a Sunday law to be enacted in our land. And now that the movement is right upon us, we ask, will our people do their duty in the matter? Can we not assist in lifting the standard and in calling to the front those who have a regard for their religious rights and privileges? Evening, everybody. I have a very, very serious message this evening entitled, Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Let's have a word of prayer. Loving Lord, Father God in heaven, thank you for traveling mercy this evening. We want to pause from all of our activities and to study your word this evening. We want to thank you for the many blessings. We pray now, Lord, that you would enlighten our minds in a way that we have never experienced before. And ultimately, we pray that your son Jesus will get all the glory. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's turn to the book of John chapter 10. John chapter 10, as we are looking at a subject entitled, Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? John chapter 10. And as you are turning to the book of John chapter 10, let me draw your attention to what it says here on the screen. It says here, this is from CNN Weather, June 23rd, 2020. The historic Saharan dust plume is darkening skies in the Caribbean and will soon stretch into the United States of America. It's like one event after another. And as Spirit of Prophecy tells us here, notice, she says, As I hear of the terrible calamities that from week to week are taking place in the world, I ask myself, what do these things mean? Are they permitted to come to arouse those who are transgressing the law of God? The most awful disasters by fire and flood are following one another in quick succession. The judgment of God are in the land. They speak in solemn warning, saying, Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the who is coming, the Son of Man. Who's that? Jesus Christ, he cometh. This is from Vivian Herald, July 14, 1903. Again, as she says here, these things are happening in quick succession, one after another. Notice again on the screen, this is from the Catholic News Agencies, June 22nd, 2020. Catholic Bishop urges UK to do what now? To preserve Sunday as a day of rest. As we see these calamities, taking place, the answer is Sunday sacredness. And the call for a Sunday sacredness or Sunday law is intensifying indeed. I go back to the article. It says, a bishop has urged Christians to speak out against plans to relax Sunday trading laws in the United Kingdom as the economy reels from the effects of the coronavirus pandemic. As we emerge from lockdown, it is regrettable that the government is considering removing the remaining legal protections of Sunday in order to make it a full trading day, the Bishop of Shrewsbury said. He goes on to say, proposals for unrestricted Sunday trading may be in included within plans to revive economic activity and so place new demands upon the very shop workers and their families who have supported us throughout this crisis. Whatever economic challenges or advantages the government may calculate, the human loss will surely be, notice carefully, greater if what now? Sunday becomes just another working day. In other words, the recovery for the coronavirus or out of the coronavirus is Sunday. Notice, the bishop said that scraping Sunday trading restrictions could lead to the downgrading of major Christian celebrations. They're referring to like 
Easter, Christmas, and so on. We would be discarding the Christian heritage of a shared day of rest and all the human values which the observance of Sunday has involved. If degrading Sunday as a day of rest, of family, of community, of worship, marginally enhance our faltering economy, it would not be justified because of its deeper impact upon human well-being. This is a moment for us to raise our voices so our Christian Sunday is not discarded by a political slate of hand. And I'm telling you, as I mentioned last Sabbath, the, those two movements that are galloping right now, and we can hear the sound of them, the Sunday movement and the mandatory vaccination, it's coming. It's right upon us. And as a matter of fact, I didn't have the time to go into the rest of this article and what they're saying. Now, this is a bishop or the bishops, Rome, Vatican, crying out against the government of the UK to relax Sunday trading so that they can help the, the economy to recover as a result of the lockdown and so on and so forth. But as a result of this movement, which I will make another video about this, as a result of this protest by the Catholic bishops, now the government have surrendered to the Catholic bishops. They said, no, we're not going to violate Sunday anymore. I didn't have the time to put all of that in this because I have to deal with something else here entitled, Who is Jesus? We are in the book of John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And as we have been studying for the past few weeks, even over a month now, about the life of Jesus Christ, His ministry, what He has done for us. And I would like to look at this subject entitled, who is Jesus? Now, the reason for this is because there are many Jesus, quote-unquote, Jesuses out there, even within this denomination. As I stated before, Christianity is the most divided religion in our world. And if you were to put even a bullseye on this, you will find that Seventh-day Adventists is the most divided denomination in the world. The most divided denomination in the world. Why? Because we have many among us who think that they know better, they know how to interpret scriptures, so they have made it a private interpretation as Peter had counseled us not to do. You have many groups within Seventh-day Adventists, the Flat Earthers, the um, 2520, the father-son movement, you have, what else? Give me another one, Feast. another distraction. The feast keeping, what's another distraction? There, there's, there's so many of them. And if you were to look at this group and that group and this other group, and they all profess to have the truth. The yeah, you have that too. They all profess to have the truth. So if this says what they are promoting is the truth and you have to believe it in order to quote unquote to be saved and this one tell, says the same thing and this one says the same thing you realize what's what's happening here then you have to embrace all of them and when you do that you really end up following a different Jesus it's a different Jesus you have one group telling you that this is how it is you have even the father son movement telling you that if you don't believe that uh, in what they're teaching, you're not going to be saved. And they tell you there's no Holy Spirit. They tell you there's no Holy Spirit. And they even go as far as to demote Jesus Christ from being God to, as Mesa, one of their leaders have said, to, uh, he's not divine, but we, 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 can still worship him i'm like which is it because the bible tells me only god can be worshiped so if he's not god but yet we still have to worship him then that's idolatry that's blasphemy 
As a matter of fact, they go back and forth. Their teachings are not consistent. And last Sabbath afternoon, when I did that message, at the beginning of the message, some of you may remember, I was addressing something similar to that effect uh, about the Holy Spirit and Jesus. You remember this? Last Sabbath afternoon. And you, you can only imagine. They started to bombard me with all kinds of messages. They are like those, some of the, not all of them, because I have friends within this movement, but some of them, they are like hyenas. If you dare say anything against what they believe, they are like all over you. And they will harass you until you succumb, until you surrender. And you can tell that because there's no Holy Spirit, according to them, you can tell that that's another spirit. And they try to come up with all kinds of texts. And I'm going to do many videos out there to expose this abomination. I'm going to do many videos and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to have to answer to them. I'm just going to let them keep sending me messages. Again, our topic is, who is Jesus? John chapter 10, notice with me in John chapter 10, Jesus is speaking here. He says, beginning in verse 9, he says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life. He came for what reason? I want you to keep that in mind. Jesus came to give life. Now, who can give life? Can Satan give life? Hmm? Only God can give life. But Christ says, I am come to give life and not just any kind of life and that they might have it more abundantly i am the good shepherd he says the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep jesus says he has come to give life and to give it more abundantly only god can give life that's number one and also we can read John chapter 1, same book, John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was what? God. And He was in the beginning, from the beginning. Now, some has been, have been trying to come up with what beginning that was, when none of those things had been revealed unto us. And then verse 14 says, And the word, that is God, became flesh and dwelt among us. And if you also read the latter part of the book of John, I believe, when Philip or Thomas bowed to Jesus when he realized that he, was, he had been raised from the dead, what did he say? He said, My Lord and my what? And my God. That would be blasphemy for Jesus to accept this saying from Thomas if he was not God. If he was not the Almighty. So who is Jesus? Let's go to the book of Micah with me. Where are we heading to? Micah, minor prophet Micah. Who is Jesus is our topic this evening. And I'm telling you, many people are being deceived. As Jesus says in the last days, Deception will be the theme, and many are gravitating towards this movement. Many of them are telling us there's no Holy Spirit. That's how it started. Then they started to demote Jesus Christ. As I stated before, I went to one of their baptisms. You know Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 19, verse 20 where Jesus himself, with his own mouth, commanded the disciples to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They would not dare to say, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They would not do it. I went to their baptisms before, and the guy who was doing the baptism, every time he raises his hand, I think they baptized maybe seven or ten people, every time he raises his hand, and he said, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son. And 
He choked himself on the Holy Spirit. He would not say it. He choked himself on the Holy Spirit. And when the Bible says, baptize them, and you can read countless, well, I shouldn't say countless, but many passages within the writing of Sister White, where she says that is the model, that is how we should baptize people, but they would not dare say the Holy Spirit. It is a different spirit that is driving this movement, and in the name of Jesus, I am going to confront it. Notice, who is Jesus? Go to the book of Micah with me. Micah chapter 1, or chapter 5, I'm sorry. Chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come. Who's the he? Forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. Notice carefully. Whose goings forth have been from when? From of old, from everlasting. Now, question. How long is everlasting? Another question. When did everlasting begin? Hmm? When, it, when, when, when is the beginning? You see, this is, this is the whole point of the matter here. There's no such thing as a beginning here. That's basically what it's telling us. Can we fully comprehend this as human being uh, with our peanut brain? Can we fully comprehend this? Can thou shall search and find God or something like that? The Bible tells us. Hmm? Job says, can you really understand God? When is the beginning? You can't really come up with this. This movement within Seventh-day Adventists to try to come up with, and I'm going to come to this, the word begotten. This is the word that they have been using to say that there is a beginning. And I'm going to address this tonight. The word begotten. And this is why I've started with Micah chapter 5. It tells us here, the one that was promised, that came, the word who became flesh, who was also with God and was God, it says, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. How long is everlasting? When did it begin? You cannot comprehend this. You will go crazy if you try to come up with, hey, when was that? And that is the reason why you have many atheists today. They try to come up with a time that they think that the earth evolved. And, you know, because you cannot really comprehend those things, so they came up with billions of years. It's the same mentality, trying to come up with something. Now, notice on the screen with me, we're going to look at several passages here, dealing with the begotten. What we want to highlight here as we look at these passages, the word begotten is really not referring to a beginning. It's not referring to a chronological order. It's really talking about preeminence. And the word preeminence means the fact of surpassing all others' superiority. Let's look at this passage here from Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. I usually don't like to have the scriptures on the screen, but I wanted to highlight something. But you can also make the note in your Bible. Notice, this is Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the what again? The first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Now we see the word begotten. Now the question we want to ask, as the so-called father-son movement have been using, oh, begotten, that God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son. So they have used that to say, okay, the word begotten there, meaning that he had a beginning. Um, God brought him forth at some point. Uh, he, he was born at some point, whatever they say. Well, let's look at the word begotten in this verse. Revelation 1, 5, it says that Christ was the first begotten of the dead. Was Christ the first person to be raised from the dead? 
Notice these passages, you can take a note of them. All of those passages are dealing with individuals who were raised, who died and were raised from the dead. I'm not going to take the time to go through all of those passages, but you can look them up. You can make a note of them. All of those passages deal with individuals who died and was raised from the dead. Now, especially in the book of John chapter 11, verses 39 and 44. This is referring to Lazarus that was dead. Oh, who was dead? And then Christ raised him from the dead. But yet we find this passage in the book of Revelation that he was the first begotten. Same word, begotten from the dead. Was he the first one who had ever been raised from the dead? No. And we can even, as, as I show you on the screen here, as far back as to the time of Elisha, right? To the time of Elisha, when he raised up that young boy who, who had died. Let's look at a contrast here. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 17, speaking of Abraham, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his what again? Only begotten son. Question. Was Isaac the first son of Abraham? No, there was Ishmael. Why was he called begotten? Why was Isaac called begotten? Because it means preeminence, not a, in chronological order. You understand? Preeminence. Because that was the son that was promised. You understand? That was the son that was promised. That was the son that would inherit the blessing that God had given to Abraham and that would be passing on to Isaac, not to Ishmael. It is in that context the word begotten is being used. Again, let's look at another passage. Go to the book of John. Where are we heading to? John chapter 8. John chapter 8, beginning in verse 48. And part of the reasons why I am dealing with this topic, not to attack anybody, but it's because I see this deception is growing. It is growing. And I've done a series on this before. Don't remember how many videos I did on that. Uh, almost a couple years ago now. And ever since then, I've received so many attacks from them. I mean, like I said, they like hyenas. Not all of them, some of them. They will attack you if you dare to stand and say, yes, there is a third person in the Godhead. If you dare to say that Jesus is God and Daniel Mesa and the other deceived one, Mansu and whoever he is, they will tell you that, well, they even said with their own mouth that it was the Father who gave Moses the Ten Commandments. This is blasphemy because both the Bible and spirit of prophecy tells us it was Jesus who gave Moses the Ten Commandments, not the Father. It was Christ who gave them the Ten Commandments. Notice carefully in John chapter 8, notice this dialogue here between Christ and the Pharisees. And keep in mind the two main reasons why the Jews wanted to kill Jesus and the two main reasons why the Jews delivered Jesus to the Romans was because he claimed to be God. And the second one was they, they said they accused him of breaking the Sabbath. Those were the two main reasons why the Jews wanted to kill him. Because he claimed to be God and they accused him of breaking the Sabbath. Notice carefully, it tells us in John chapter 8, beginning in verse, let's see. Let's go back to verse 41. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. What did they mean by that? We be not born of fornication. You know what they're referring to? Do you know what they're referring to? Because he was, he was, his mother was accused that he was. Yes. Yeah, because they're saying Joseph was, was not your father. Mm, who was your father? That means he was born out of red light. That's what they're saying to Jesus right now. Again, it goes on to say, 
Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not, which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God, he with God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews, and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan, and hast what now? A devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory, there is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Notice carefully. If a man keep my saying, what did Jesus say again? He came, John chapter 10, as we read a moment ago, he came to give life. life. So he says, if you keep my saying, ye will not see death. But notice now. Then, uh, because he said this, the Jews started to put two and two together that this man is claiming to be God. Because only God can give you life. Notice. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead. And the prophets and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Do you see it? The, the Jews understood that only God could give, could give life. Only God can keep someone from dying. Right? So they started to understand that he, Jesus, was claiming to be God. And to them, based on the knowledge of scriptures that they had, that's blasphemy. Then he went on to say, Are thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? You see the question? Are you saying that you are God? Who do you think you are? Notice, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Oh boy, now he's going to get himself into a lot of trouble now. Wait a minute now. Your father, Abraham, we just to see my day. Wait a minute. Notice. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was. What are the next two words? Oh boy. Oh boy. I am, Jesus says. That echoes in their ears. When Jesus says, I am, it takes them back to? Yes, <laughs> Mount Sinai. Whom shall I say that sent me? Moses asked God. What is your name? God says to Moses, I am that I am. Notice, the Jews, they were not dumb. Even though they were deceived by Satan, but they knew scriptures. They were not dumb. Notice carefully. It says, verse 59, Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Why did they pick up stone to stone him? Hmm? He, he was blaspheming. How was he blaspheming? 
Go to John now, yes, very good. Go to the book of John chapter 11. Well, we're still in the book of John chapter 11. Let's look at verse 8. John chapter 11, verse 8. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? The Jews wanted to stone him for what reason again? Because of blasphemy, he made himself God. At that very moment, that's when the threat against Christ was intensified because he claimed to be God. Even the disciples now were afraid for his life at that moment. Notice on the screen what Spirit of Prophecy says. Desire of Ages 469, paragraph 5. With solemn dignity, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Silence fell upon the vast assembly. The name of God, notice carefully, the name of God, the I am, the name of God, given to Moses to express the idea of the eternal presence had been claimed as his own by this Galilean rabbi. Who was the Galilean rabbi? That was Jesus. Then it says, he had announced himself to be the self, what are the words? Self-existent one. Oh no, don't say that to the uh, anti-Trinitarians, to the Father-Son movement. They'll try to come up with something from the writing of Sister White to say, you know, it didn't really mean self-existent. Mansu, he's very good at this. Very good at twisting those things. Notice, he who had been promised to Israel, who, notice she's quoting Micah 5, 2, as we read before, who's going forth, have been from of old, from the days of eternity. How long is that? <laughs> we don't know. We cannot comprehend it. Notice, again, the priests and rabbis cried out against Jesus as a blasphemer. His claim to be one with God had before stirred them to take his life. And a few months later, they plainly declare, for a good work, we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, for what now? For blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, maketh thyself God. That's John 10, 33. What was the reason why they wanted to kill him now? It was for the same reason they almost threw him off a cliff. Remember? In the book of Luke chapter 4, when he presented himself as the Messiah, they almost threw him off a cliff. They said, hey, isn't this Joseph's son? Because they understood, based on the prophecies, that the Messiah is God himself that was going to come. God himself. And that's what we read throughout the Old Testament, leading to the New Testament. And notice, let's go back to the screen. Because he was and avowed himself to be the Son of God, they were bent on destroying him. Now, many of the people, notice carefully, as a result, siding with the priests and rabbis, took up stones to cast at him. So it wasn't just the religious leaders now, who were taking up stone to stone him for the claim of being the I am. The people were following the leaders. And that's the deception taking place today. Many people are following the smooth leaders, Daniel, Mesa, and the others. Following the same leaders saying Jesus was not God. If Jesus were to come today, and say that before Abraham was, I am, that he is God, the father-son movement will pick up stones as well. Because it is the same account here. They would have picked up stone. This anti-Trinitarian out there, they would have picked up stone to stone him. They would have done the same thing. Because they don't believe that he is God. With their own mouth, Daniel, Mesa, and the other one, they said, if you worship Jesus, that's idolatry. Idolatry, come on. Yet, Seventh-day Adventists, listen to those blasphemers. B listen to those men. I'm telling you, our worst bla uh, enemies are within. As Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, the very first sign, beware lest any man deceive you. 
and deception comes in many forms. Notice, back to the screen again. Now many of the people siding with the priests and rabbis took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. Very similar account as in Luke chapter 4, when he presented himself as the Messiah. And one of the things that this movement, the Protestant movement has used to scare people is by using the word Trinity. That's the word because that's Catholic. They use that. They've done a very good job as, at brainwashing Seventh-day Adventists, scaring Seventh-day Adventists because the Roman Catholic used the word Trinity. I don't like using the word Trinity either. I, I like to use the word God, Godhead. But what they have done, they put everything to the Roman Catholic. When in actuality, you know what the Roman Catholic believes when it comes to the Holy Spirit? The same thing the anti-Trinitarians believe. That the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father, is the Spirit of Christ, not a third person. As a matter of fact, in the Roman Catholic teaching, Mary is really the third person there. Not the Holy Spirit according to scripture and spirit of prophecy. That's how this movement is deceiving Seventh-day Adventists. And like I said, Satan is a student of the Bible. Did you know that? Yes. Yes, he's very clever, very cunning. And those men that are teaching these things are inspired by Satan. I'm going to get quite a few messages about that. Notice carefully. Again, let's go back to the Bible. Well, you know this, Philippians. Let's quickly go to the book of Philippians with me. Philippians chapter 2. Let's look at another passage here dealing with who is Jesus. Philippians chapter 2. Where are we heading to? Philippians chapter 2. Who is Jesus? Is he just a regular man or is he God? Is he the I am? Notice carefully in Philippians chapter 2, very familiar passage, beginning in verse 5. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of what? Of God, thought it not robbery to be, what's the word? Equal, Equal with God. Well, then we must remove all of those passages from the Bible according to the anti-Trinitarians. As a matter of fact, they tell us that Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20 don't belong in the Bible. So they want to remove anything that they disagree with, anything that stands in contradiction to what they want to believe. That's the key there. This is what they want to believe. You see, this is like a little child you know, who's trying to seek for attention or somebody who's trying to come up with something new. That's what, what this movement is about. Then they will go back to say, well, the pioneers, this pioneer, that pioneer believed that. Well, that was that pioneer. As far as I know, those pioneers were not inspired. Only Ellen White was inspired. And many of the pioneers did believe in there's no Holy Spirit. They had the anti-Trinitarian teachings among them. But did you know, by the time in the late 1800, when Sister White started to publish literatures about the uh, uniqueness of the Holy Spirit, calling the Holy Spirit the third person of the Godhead, many of the pioneers started to change their mind about the Holy Spirit. I quoted all of those things before, but it doesn't matter to many of them. They have, been see they have sealed their mind regardless of what you show them. They're not going to accept it because they want to accept what seems like new theory, new teachings, and they have those teachers brainwashing them constantly. Again, uh, Christ here, the Bible says that he was equal with God. That means the Father, but made himself on no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. But yet they tried to come up with a specific time that Christ was born. And this is the reason why Christ can say that I have come to give life and to give it more abundantly because he is God. He is the I am. He is Jehovah. Notice carefully what Spirit of Prophecy tells us here. Not one of the angels, notice carefully, could have become 
surety for the human race. Their life is what? Is God's. They could not surrender it. They could not surrender their life. The angels all wear the yoke. I want you to pay attention to this phrase here. The angels all wear the yoke of obedience. Understand what she's doing here. She is making a contrast between the angels who were created versus Jesus. She's saying that the angel, none of the angel could pay the penalty for your sin because their life is God's. If one of them were to be sent to die for your sin, that means they could not raise themselves back up from the dead. You understand? Because they are not the author of life. You see? Notice. They are the appointed messengers, the angels are, the appointed messengers of him who is the commander of all heaven. That would be Jesus Christ. But Christ is equal with God, the Father. What's the next word? Infinite. Question, how long is infinite? Forever, right? No beginning, no end. And omnipotent. He could pay the ransom for men's freedom. He is the eternal again, self-existing son on whom no yoke had come. Where did we read this word before? Yoke, right there. She says here, the angels all wear the yoke of obedience, but in contrast, Jesus had no yoke. You see the contrast here? Because it was God. I want you to understand, the angels wore the yoke of obedience, but Jesus is God. You understand? He is God. He, he wears no yoke of obedience. But as we just read here, this is the reason why I'm trying to show you this passage with Philippians chapter 2 here. What did we read? In verse 6, who, Christ, being in the form of God, taught it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. So what did he do? He surrendered his divinity. That's basically what we're reading here from the Bible in here. He surrendered his divinity to be obedient to the Father. Then it says, and was made in the likeness of, of what? Of men. The servant there tells you that he had chosen to wear this yoke of obedience. But that was not the case before. He did that, number one, to vindicate the father's character, and number two, to save you and I. Very, very important to remember that and Christ on whom no yoke had come. No yoke. He did not have to obey because he was God. He surrendered to the father. And this is why the Bible says, verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he did what? Humble himself and became obedient unto death, unto death, even the death of the cross. So he surrendered. He surrendered. So that he might be our example. Notice carefully. Then it says, And when God asked, Whom shall I send? He, Christ, could reply, here I am, send me. He could pledge himself to become men's surety, for he could say that which the highest angel could not say. I have power over my own life, power to lay it down, and power to what? To take it again. As Sister White tells us, that Christ's life was unborrowed. His life was what? Unborrowed. That means he didn't get his life from anybody. He was the self-existing existing one. That's what we just read. No beginning. Brothers and sisters, we have to understand that many, while at the same time, this group, the other reason why this 
it is very dangerous with what those men are teaching is because they also claim to be present truth. You understand? They also claim to be present truth and many of them have been quote unquote, they say marginalized from the general conference and they have started their own self-supported group. That's what makes it dangerous because they claim to be part of the present truth movement. And by God's grace, I'm going to concentrate on our next studies and to expose this thing because this is very dangerous. When you're telling me that Jesus is not God, you're demoting him to something else and there's no Holy Spirit, that is very dangerous. That is of the devil. Speaking of that, now I want to share with you what it means to stand up for Jesus Christ in these last days. Last Sabbath afternoon, I shared this passage with you or this article with you where they are pushing for this mandatory vaccination and they are telling us that if you're going to refuse the vaccine, you will not be able to seek employment, to go to certain places, and as the next one says, restaurants could be allowed the right to refuse entry to those who are not vaccinated against COVID-19, businesses, especially those involved in the care or service of vulnerable communities, might be allowed the right to refuse employment to those without a COVID-19 vaccination. Organizers of mass gatherings could deny the sale of tickets on this basis. In other words, they are telling us very similar thing that Revelation chapter 13 tells us, verses 16 and 17, that you will not be able to buy and sell or sell. You will not be able to do those things. And this movement for a mandatory vaccination are coming along with the Sunday law. They are combining those things together. Keep in mind, based on what inspiration tells us, in order to save the planet, to stop the destruction of the planet, that's why they're going to push for Sunday. Well, the COVID-19 that they have given us, they're saying that it's a threat to the planet. And so the two things they are pushing as a solution for COVID-19 is Sunday sacredness, as we just looked at a moment ago, and this vaccination. As Seventh-day Adventists, and I've shown you before how even the General Conference are pushing are on board for the vaccine. As Seventh-day Adventists, we should stand on the Bible and the Bible alone as the three Hebrew boys and Daniel did, Daniel chapter 1. They will not violate their conscience by putting something unclean in the body. Now, what if I were to tell you that we have this ministry here, Amazing Facts Ministry. Recently, they had a session of question and answer with their AFCO online schooling. What if I were to tell you that this ministry is telling Seventh-day Adventists that there's nothing wrong with vaccine, that we should go along with it? I'm going to play the clip for you and we're going to listen carefully and we're going to analyze this. Notice carefully. Next question. This is an interesting one too. Are vaccines with unclean ingredients to be considered unclean? Okay, I want you to understand what the question is here. Are vaccines with unclean ingredients to be considered unclean? Keep in mind, this just came out and there is a mandatory... COVID-19 vaccines that they are pushing. Now, all of those ministries that have 501c3, they must obey and follow the guidelines of the, uh, of the government. What's the answer? Notice carefully. <laughs> well, maybe if, uh, and you jump in your past, it, I, maybe if you're going to eat it, but, uh, you know, I've heard of people who've, whose lives have been saved by having a valve placed in their heart that comes from a pig mm -hmm. because it just so happens that the valve of the pig is very similar to the human valve in the heart and of course there's no problem there okay what was the first answer he said he has heard that some people have been saved because of the transfer of a pig valves into a human now question for you now 
My Bible tells me that we should not put anything unclean in the body. It's not just about eating it, period, unclean into the body. Let me speak for myself. If I were to get to a, that point where that's what the doctors were to recommend, I would rather die. I would rather die than to have that into my body because my Bible tells me that this is unclean. I should not defile the body. Now that's my conscience that somebody else can think for themselves. I would rather die. I don't believe that God wants us to, to have that substitute. I believe God wants us to trust him. This is what it means to trust God. You cannot look at another alternative. Oh, what's plan B? No, there's only, as Christians, we should only have one plan, and that is Jesus and Jesus alone. If it doesn't come through for me, then his will be done. Let's continue. And of course, there's no problem there. That's not eating the unclean food. It's actually benefiting from something that the pig has. It's probably not too many things you can benefit from the pig. He said you are benefiting from something that the pig have. Did you hear it? He said you are benefiting from something that the pig have. Is that the will of God? I do not believe it. Notice carefully. But, you football. know, uh, which is that? A football. A uh, football. American football, sorry. But anyway. <laughs> That's right. Big skin. <laughs> Big skin, yeah. But um, it's quite different than eating that which is unclean. I mean, the purpose of not eating something that is unclean is because of the, the health consequences of doing that. You notice the justification so far. He's saying, he's making the case really for accepting the vaccine. He's saying this, this is not something you're eating. That's the only time it would be considered unclean. You understand? He's making the case for the vaccine. Notice. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have dogs. Right. Dogs are unclean. Yeah. But they make wonderful pets. <laughs> they do. Did you hear the next one? He said dogs are unclean but they make wonderful pet. Do you get the point? Dogs are unclean, but they make wonderful pet. He's saying, well, if you have dogs, why can't you have the vaccine? Because dogs are unclean. Am I eating the dog? My pet dog? That is a lame, a deceptive argument here. Notice. Yeah, I think by the time they... Um when they melt down the ingredients to make a vaccine, these things are so uh, hyper-processed that it's almost yeah. been being boiled down to its, uh, you know, its base and ingredients. Vaccine. And you know, if the vaccine is going to save people's lives, then uh, it's probably yeah. a good thing. He just said, Doug Batchelor just said, uh, by the time they're done with the vaccine, you know, after they've done whatever they have, hey, it came down to nothing. If it's gonna save lives, hey, there's nothing wrong with the vaccine. Do you know why they're talking like that? They have their tax exempt status. They have to talk like that. While they have a tax exempt status, they have to go along with what the government says. This is very deceiving. This is, this is very deceiving. Oh, just go along with it because it saves lives. What about all of those lives that it destroy? Hmm? What about all of those lives? I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, where the Bible says that we cannot mix light with darkness, Jesus with Belial. We cannot do that. And Sister White says we can mix poison with, how did she say it? I'm trying to, I wish I had looked that up before. We can mix poison with, you know, you know, with some food, but it will still end up being poison. Let's continue. Goes on to say. And I just think that sometimes people are just looking at excuses not to take vaccines, right? Did you hear what he said? People are just looking for excuses not to take vaccines. In other words, those leaders from Amazing Facts are telling us, get ready to take the COVID-19 vaccines. That's what they're telling us. And keep in mind, this ministry has millions of followers worldwide and they are positioning themselves and say hey if it's gonna save lives you have pet dogs right uh, do, do you keep them inside your house 
Well, if you can have pet dogs, then you can have the vaccine. What a deception. Unbelievable. Let's move on. These are the points there that we just looked at from Amazing Facts, justification for the vaccine. They says, a valve that comes from a pig that is not eating the unclean food, you are benefiting from something that the pig has. Dogs are unclean, but they make wonderful pets. And then Pastor Dog says, vaccines are a good thing. They save people's lives. But what did the three Hebrew boys say in Daniel chapter one? You don't need to turn there for the sake of time. They purpose in their heart that they would not defile themselves, regardless of what it is. And Seventh-day Adventists, as Christ told us in Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 and 16, pointed to the book of Daniel that we need to study in these last days. And what do we find? The stand that those men made in Daniel chapter 1. They will not defile themselves. While today we have leaders that are telling us something contrary. It is part of the apostasy, brothers and sisters. Now I'm going to take you to some other articles showing you, again, speaking of deception, how deep that deception is in the apostasy. Background. As we've been looking at, the General Conference have been promoting all of the uh, social justice or justices that have been going on out there. Social justice for the LGBT movement, Black Lives Matter movement, all of them. Now, we're going to look at another one. This one has to do with women and also with the LGBT. Notice carefully. This tells us here from Advent Messenger, June 22nd, 2020. Feminism, ecumenism, and the LGBT plus agenda when Seventh-day Adventists participate in their own demise. Why would we align ourselves with anti-biblical movements one would think that Seventh-day Adventists would resist the social upheaval of the LGBT plus agenda, feminism, and ecumenism. These godless liberal movements are determined to destroy Adventism. Instead of standing against this assault on our faith, feeble leaders would rather join the chorus of the anti-religious revolution. Let's continue. News.adventist.it is the official news source for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Italy. News.adventist.it is owned and operated by the Italian Union of Seventh-day Adventist Churches. On May 6, 2020, they published a story promoting the pro-feminist, pro-LGBT+, and pro ecumenical organization called the Interreligious Observatory on Violence Against Women. On what now? Violence Against Women. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, we are being bombarded by one deception after another. If not from the General Conference, it is from the anti-Trinitarian movement. Notice carefully the next article here. This is from the actual website of that Italian Seventh-day Adventist conference. May 6, this was published, 2020. A year of interreligious observatory on violence against women. Do you see the movement? If it's not Black Lives Matter movement, it's this one. And do you remember the keyword there? Feminism. What is that? What is feminism? Do you know what that is? It's not just equal rights. It's a women movement. It's more than equal rights. It's to do away with the order of the home. The biblical order of the home. It's to do away with it. Where do you think that women wearing certain clothes, pants come from? It came from feminism. It came from, I can't remember this lady what's that no actually way before that during the time of sister white that there was this counterfeit going on notice back to the screen a little over a year ago the oivd the interreligious observatory on violence against women was born in bologna that's italy 
On that occasion, 22 women of various religious traditions, evangelical, Christian, Catholic, of course, Orthodox, Jewish, Islamic, who else? Mm -hmm. Hindu and Buddhist met to sign a memorandum of understanding and create a network of people increasingly aware of the issue. It goes on to say, in a society attentive to people's rights, the difference in treatment between men and women is no longer tolerable. A difference often masked by ideologies that the keyword there to remember. What's this word? Patriarchal order has shaped and transmitted. It is necessary to identify ways of mutual recognition, respecting the various identities, religious faiths, can make a fundamental contribution to rebalancing gender relations. What's the key word there? Patriarchal. What does that mean? Notice what Spirit of Prophecy tells us. In early times, the father was the ruler and priest of his own family. And he, the father, exercised authority over his children, even after they had families of their own. His descendants were taught to look up to him as their head in both religious and secular matters. This, what's the word there? Patriarchal, Patriarchal system of government. Notice carefully, Abraham endeavored to perpetrate as he tended to do what? To preserve the knowledge of God. What was supposed to preserve the knowledge of God? The patriarchal system. What are they after here? The patriarchal order. Do you see it? The feminism movement. Notice. It, the patriarchal system, was necessary to bind the members of the household together in order to build up a barrier against the what? Idolatry. That's the patriarchal system was necessary to bind the members of the household. That would be the church as well that had become so widespread and, meaning idolatry had become so widespread, so deep-seated, Abraham sought by every means in his power to guard the inmates of his encampment against mingling with the what? The hidden and witnessing their idolatrous practices. For he knew, Abraham knew, that familiarity, keyword there, familiarity, with evil would insensibly corrupt the principles. The greatest care was exercised to shut out every form of false religion and to impress the mind with the majesty and glory of the living God as the true object of worship. And uh, in other words, the patriarchal system was there to preserve, as it says there, the knowledge of God of the true God and to keep the people from falling into idolatry. Notice, back to Advent Messenger. Again, it says here, they are in like step, this feminism movement, they are in like step with the LGBT plus movement. The OIVD also speaks highly of the feminist resistance movement of Italy on its website. Should we be promoting should we be uniting with such a movement that the, the, the sole goal or the main goal is to destroy the patriarchal system? Notice carefully. This is a movement that is dedicated to ending the what again? The patriarchy, a system in which men hold primary position as in the where? The church. Hence, we have women ordination, women pastors. That's where this movement came from. It's not biblical to have women pastors. It's all about feminism. Equal rights. Next website. This is their website there. It says here, Interreligious Observatory on Violence Against Women. Here, you can see them gathering together in this picture around the flag, the LGBT flag, and this ceremony with candles. This is them. 
This is the LGBT flag, and that's them, feminism. You could see exactly what we just read from Spirit of Prophecy, to do away with the God of heaven and to worship a different God. And I'm telling you, those within the Father-Son movement, they are not worshiping the true God because Jesus is not God according to them. They are worshiping a different God that they have made up. And that's exactly what you are seeing on the screen here. Notice, article went on to say, we are indeed, notice now, Buddhist, Hindu, and then Jewish and so on. And then who else? Adventist. And sadly, we see Waldensian there. Boy, those Waldensians who have given up their lives for the truth of the Bible, if they were alive today, what would they say? To see this taking place and you have the Roman Catholic Church leading this out. Notice, then Baptist, Catholic there as well, Muslim. And then it says, during the ceremony in which we were born in the world with a loud and official voice, each woman of the constituent group made a symbolic gesture. She delivered her unique color flower to a girl who collected them with bitter grace. With the gesture, we are what now? United in a polychrome bouquet of flowers, our desire for peace and justice, and we gave them to her who was the what now? The body of our beings. This is paganism. This is idolatry. Yet we have the general conference there. Notice, who are different and will talk to each other starting from their own diversity in a desire to give body to a living practice of feminist theology of interreligious dialogue. What blasphemy, brothers and sisters. This is a different God that is being promoted and worshipped here. It is to do away with the patriarchal system which we were told was passed on to Abraham to preserve the knowledge of the true God. Notice back to Spirit of Prophecy, Patriarchs and Prophets, 141, paragraph 3. It was a wise arrangement, the patriarchal system, which God himself had made. For what reason? To cut off his people so far as possible from connection with the hidden. And I think this picture speaks for itself. The patriarchal movement was given, or system, was given to separate us from this paganism. Notice carefully. It goes on to say, again, to cut off his people so far as possible from connection with the hidden, making them a people dwelling alone and not reckon among the nations. He, God, had separated Abraham from his idolatrous kindred, pause. Who separated Abraham there? Before Abraham was I am. That was Jesus, right? He had separated Abraham from his idolatrous kindred that the patriarch might train and educate his family apart from the seductive influences which would have surrounded them in Mesopotamia. That means where Abraham lived before. And that the true faith might be preserved in its purity by his descendants from generation to generation. This feminist or feminism movement is nothing more than an attack on the patriarchal system, which as we read a moment ago, separated God's people from the hidden and also to preserve a knowledge of the true God. Next article here, this says, Bologna from religions and embankment to violence against women. Who's at the center of this movement? Rome agent. Rome agent. That's the feminist movement. Who is leading it out? Rome. As we are told, all roads lead to, to Rome. Went on to say, the interreligious observatory on violence against women, which is presented today at the where? 
at the John 23rd Foundation for Religious Sciences has its roots on this ground. Has its roots where? Rome. That's the Pope there that they refer to, John 23rd Foundation. The leaders, brothers and sisters, are not taking us to the heavenly Canaan. They are not on this path to cross over to the other side of Jordan. They are crossing the Tiber River, which leads us to Rome. Notice what Spirit of Prophecy says. Great controversy, 464. In many of the revivals which have occurred during the last half century, the same influences have been at work to a greater or less degree. That will be manifest in the more extensive movements of the future. There is an emotional excitement, a mingling of the true with the false that is well adapted to, what's the word? Mislead. Yet none need be deceived. In the light of God's word, it is not difficult to determine the nature of these movements. Wherever men neglect the testimony of the Bible, turning away from those plain soul-testing truths which require self-denial and renunciation of the world, there we may be sure that God's blessing is not bestowed. This movement is not of God. Plainly, clearly, we could see who is leading this movement. And we are told it is a backsliding church that lessens its distance between herself and, and Rome. We need to know Jesus for ourselves, brothers and sisters. Who is Jesus? Is he the I am as he claimed to be? Is he the first and the last? Let's go to the book of Revelation as we're coming to a close. Book of Revelation chapter 1. Where are we heading to? Revelation chapter 1. The chapter or this book begins by telling us this here. Whose revelation is it? It says in verse 8, very familiar passage, you know it, Revelation chapter 1, as we are answering the question again, who is Jesus? Well, he said, I am Alpha, and what else? And Omega, and what does that mean? The beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, notice now, and which was, and which is to come, the what? What's the title for him? The Almighty. Whose title is this? Can I call myself the Almighty? If I were to do so, what would that mean? Blasphemy. He is the Almighty, but notice, He is the first and the last, meaning He has no beginning, no end. Notice, that's how the chapter or the book begins, the book of Revelation. But notice how it ends. Go to chapter 22. Where are we heading to? Chapter 22. Again, Repetition depends impressions. The Bible says in verse 12, Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, it says, And behold, Christ says, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Then he says, I am one again, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The Almighty, the Jehovah, the Emmanuel, God with us. Yet, in spite of all of those titles that we find within the pages of Scripture, yet many still go along with what some deceived leaders are saying that Jesus is not God. Last passage we look at, go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 44. Where are we heading to? The book of Isaiah chapter 44 the book of Isaiah chapter 44 when we see teachers coming up with false doctrines attacking the Son of God and the Holy Spirit we cannot keep quiet we cannot keep silence we have to say something notice chapter 44 the Bible tells us notice carefully in uh, verse 1 yet now hear, O Jacob my servant and Israel whom I have chosen. Who's speaking? God is speaking, right? Keep that in mind. It is God speaking here. Then it says, Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, 
which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jezurim, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring, and they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. One shall say, I am the Lord's, that means belong to the Lord, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. Who is the Lord there? Notice, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the what again? The first, and I am the last. I am the last, and beside me there is what? Where did we read the I am the first, the last? Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 22. And this is referring to whom? Jesus Christ. Then it says here, I am the last and beside, or the first and the last, and beside me there is no God. Now, question for you. If there is no God that I am the first and the last, and that is a title for Jesus Christ, can we fully comprehend this? There is no other God? Our peanut mind cannot fully comprehend this. Amen? But yet, in spite of the fact, we were told that there are certain things we should not venture into, especially when it comes to the Holy Spirit, the nature of the Spirit. We were, we were told to leave, leave the matter alone. But today, there's a movement, a deceptive movement among us who are telling us they know who and what the Spirit is or what the Spirit is not. This is deception. Again, Jesus told us in Matthew 24, deception will be the theme in these last days. But Spirit of Prophecy says, none need to be deceived. Let's close with this again. She says, yet none need be deceived. In the light of God's word, it is not difficult to determine the nature of these movements. That means if we are studying for ourselves, we will not be deceived. That's what Jesus counseled us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 to do. We need to study for ourselves, then we will not be deceived. Who is Jesus? He is the I am, the Jehovah. And beside him, there's no others. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we want to thank you in a special way for this mystery of godliness, as the Apostle Paul says. God was manifested in the flesh. And in spite of the fact that we have the scriptures, not everything has been revealed unto us. Help us, Lord, to humble ourselves before thee and to accept what you have given us and to not try to come up with new teachings, theories. Help us to humble ourselves and to learn at your feet. We ask for forgiveness, Lord, of all our sins. We pray that you will save us into your kingdom when you come in the clouds of glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.